Introduction This textbook chapter will focus on discovering where syntax is localized within the human brain. When taking a first-year psychology course, most people learn about Broca's area and the type of aphasia associated. However, syntax is a complicated subject, and recent studies have shown that syntax is not solely situated within Broca's area. Instead it appears that syntax has many various properties and uses different areas throughout the brain to process different aspects of syntax, and by harnessing the different regions in your brain, it is able to conduct the exhaustive task of decoding syntax. This chapter will lead you through the history of how syntax was localized within the brain, as well as provide information about how these older views have been replaced through new neuroimaging technology that is now available. Models of syntactic processing will also be discussed. Syntax in the brain The evolution of localizing syntax Franz Joseph Gall in the 19th century, Franz Joseph Gall proposed the only true science of mind. Phrenology. Phrenology was composed of basic tenets, such as the brain is the organ of the mind, etc. Gall believed that the mind was separated into individual faculties and that these faculties had to be separated from one another within the brain. Interestingly Gall believed that the size of the brain was equivalent to power. Gall also believed that the shape of the brain was determined by the development of the separate mental faculties. Since the skull formed its shape based on the shape of the brain, Gall theorized that the surface of the skull could be read as a way to measure psychological tendencies and aptitudes. Thus a tradition was born within the 19th century that by examining the skull of an individual, you could discover their particular intellectual aptitudes and traits. If an individual had a prominent ridge in the forehead, this indicated that they would exhibit benevolent behavior. Many phrenologists however only looked for subjects that confirmed their hypotheses and ignored those who contradicted them. Sometimes counter-evidence was explained away so that perhaps someone who did have a large benevolent organ may have other organs that counteracted the organ. It wasn't until the 1860s when another scientist demonstrated evidence that the popular science of phrenology may be wrong. Paul Broca in the 1860s a French surgeon laid the foundation of cognitive neuroscience and modern neuropsychology with the discovery of an individual, Leborn, suffering from neurological problems, who could no longer respond to questions or produce any type of speech. After the death of Leborn, Broca performed an autopsy and discovered a lesion on the left frontal lobe. A few months after the discovery of Leborn, a new patient, Lelong, came to Broca and he had a stroke earlier in the year and also suffered a neurological ailment, but unlike Leborn, he was able to produce speech. After an autopsy, Broca discovered that Lelong also had a lesion on the left frontal lobe.The region that Broca identified is now known as Broca's area, and the neurological problems that come from a disturbance within Broca's area are typically known as Broca's aphasia. Paul Broca was one of the first scientists to conclusively demonstrate that different brain areas can specify a function. This was in contrast to phrenologists who claimed that brain areas were specific to faculties, but never showed any real data that conclusively proved their claims. Lelong and Leborn both had lesions within the left frontal lobe, but Lelong was able to still communicate unlike Leborn. This difference helped Broca demonstrate that lesions needed to be very specific in location in order to affect speech production. Carl Wernicke A few years after Broca's discovery, Carl Wernicke had a patient who suffered from a stroke in 1873. Wernicke's patient was able to speak, and while his hearing was not impaired, he was unable to understand other people who spoke to him. After the patient passed, Wernicke performed an autopsy and examined the brain. Wernicke discovered a lesion in the left hemisphere of the brain, on the rear temporal parietal region, and concluded that this region was involved in speech comprehension. In Wernicke's aphasics, it has been observed that they are capable of producing sentences with correct syntax, which suggests that certain brain regions are responsible for syntax processing. Wernicke's discovery contributed to the idea that areas within the brain perform specific functions, since he discovered an aphasiac separate from Broca's aphasiacs that had a lesion within the left temporal parietal lobe. Neuropsychology people who suffer from aphasia typically have trouble with either forming speech or understanding speech. There are two different categories of aphasia. Non-fluent and fluent aphasia. People who suffer damage to the left frontal lobe typically suffer from non-fluent aphasia, Broca's aphasia. Symptoms include problems with articulation, repetition of words, speech production, speech comprehension, fluency, and problems with finding appropriate words.
People who suffer Broca's aphasia typically speak in short phrases that make sense, but take great difficulty to product. Some patients suffer from more severe forms of the disorder in that they are only able to articulate words or phrases that are always repeated whenever they try to speak, as in the case of LeBorn, who could only ever say tan. However, people with Broca's aphasia are able to understand others and thus are aware of their own mistakes. People with Broca's aphasia typically also suffer from weakness on their right side of their body. Sometimes they may be paralyzed, and this is because the frontal lobe also controls motor movements. Another type of non-fluent aphasia is global aphasia. Global aphasia is a result of extensive damage in the language centers of the brain. People who suffer from global aphasia have severe difficulties with speech and comprehension. Typically damage to the left temporal lobe causes Wernicke's aphasia, which is a fluent aphasia. However damage to the right temporal lobe can also sometimes result in Wernicke's aphasia. People who suffer from Wernicke's aphasia tend to speak in dragged out sentences that have no meaning, sometimes made up words, and sometimes unnecessary words are used as well. It's often difficult to understand what someone with Wernicke's aphasia is trying to say, and people with Wernicke's aphasia have difficulty understanding other people, as they are unaware that make mistakes. Separating syntax from semantics after Broca and Wernicke's discoveries and as technology advanced, new techniques were used to try and localize the exact regions that were critical for syntax processing. Through event-related brain potentials, ERPs, MRIs, FMRIs, and MEG scans, researchers have been working diligently to localize these regions. Researchers began to examine syntax and semantics into further detail. Evidence suggested that there was a distinct difference between semantic and syntactic processing. A study by Friedman and Forster, 1985, who set out to study the processing effects on ungrammatical violations. They showed that there were different processing systems involved in syntax processing, i.e. gender information, word category information, etc. After this study came out Neville et al., 1991, set out to discover whether syntactic processing was separate from other aspects of language processing through the use of ERP measurements. At this point in time, the only ERP measurement found from language studies was an N400, a centroparietal negativity within the brain that occurred around 400 milliseconds that was reported to be involved in semantic processing. While some studies had shown that a later P600, a late centroparietal positivity that occurred around 600 milliseconds, was observed during syntactic measurements, it had not yet been conclusively shown to be related to syntax. Neville et al., 1991, formed their study to include sentences that were semantically violated, but with proper syntax, or with violated syntax and proper semantics. They set up their experiment in such a way, so that the N400 associated with semantics could be seen as well as any other distinct ERP patterns that would perhaps be involved in syntax. They discovered that when a sentence had deviant syntax, ERP measurements were recorded that were separate from the N400. These ERP measurements were an N125, an anterior left hemisphere negativity at 125 milliseconds, which seemed to be involved in detecting syntactic violations, and a P250, left hemisphere positivity around 250 milliseconds. None of the measurements associated with syntax were observed with the N400. Neville et al., 1991, showed through ERP that syntax processing was separate from semantic processing. Localization of syntax Neville et al., 1991, had shown through ERP measurements that there were ERP measurements associated with syntax and that these measurements were separate from semantic processing. Friedericy et al., 2003, set out to demonstrate that semantic processing at the sentence level and syntactic information processing involved different systems through ERP measurements. They also found that semantic processing activates a centroparietal negativity that occurs approximately around 400 milliseconds and 400 after being shown a sentence. This potential is capable of varying due to the different variations in semantic processing, such as lexical semantic information, lexical status, pragmatic information, and thematic information. However, when Friedericy et al. 2003 compared the N400 with syntactic processing ERP measurements, syntactic processing has an early and later ERP component, left anterior negativity, ELON, that is between 140 to 400 milliseconds. A late centroparietal positivity is also associated with syntactic processing, after 600 milliseconds, P600. Friedericy et al. 2003 proposed that these two ERP components associated with syntactic processing are related to two different syntactic processes.
an initial process that is involved in automatically structure building sentences, and a later process which is involved in controlling the reanalysis and repair of syntax. After concluding that syntax and semantics were separate from one another, Frida Rissi et al. 2003, used functional magnetic resonance imaging FMRI, to try and localize the areas involved. FMRI analysis localized the N400ERP from semantic processing within the brain. The hippocampus may be involved, cortical areas within the superior temporal sulcus, and the left auditory cortex. When using FMRI to analyze the alon involved in syntactic processing, it was found that the alon was localized within the anterior temporal and inferior frontal cortices in both hemispheres, but there was left hemisphere dominance. Friederici et al. 2003 designed an experiment using anomalous sentences, abnormal sentences, in order to localize the regions involved in the P600. Friederici et al.'s 2003 study did identify that the left basal ganglia of the putamen was associated with the P600 potential. It was found to be involved in the later controlled syntactic processing, rather than with the early structure building processes. This study did show that there was a difference between semantic and syntactic processing, as well showed the different regions within the brain associated with the two ERPs involved in syntactic processing. Latter studies found that in patients who had neurodebilitating diseases like Parkinson's disease, had a reduced P600 potential as a result of impaired basal ganglia. Early researchers theorized that semantics and syntax involved in Wernicke's and Broca's area, and thus they wanted to localize semantics and syntax processing onto these areas respectively. Technologies such as electroencephalography, E, magnetencephalography, MEG, and functional magnetic resonance imaging, FMRI, studies, revealed that there were inconsistencies with this theory. Grudzinski and Frieda Rissi, 2006, examined previous research results that used MEG, FMRI, and EEG technologies and attempted to localize syntactic processing using previous results. Grudinsky and Frieda Rissi found that the frontal operculum, which is in the left inferior frontal gyrus and is adjacent to the inferior region of Broca's area, was involved in understanding phrase structures. They also found that the anterior superior temporal gyrus was involved in processing structure violations, and it appeared that it was recruited in order to identify mismatching between the incoming sentence and the expected syntactic structure of the sentence. MEG studies revealed that these two structures were involved in local phase structure building, but it appeared that the largest activation came from the left anterior supertemporal gyrus, while a smaller activation was seen in the inferior frontal cortex. Grudzinski and Friederici saw that when sentences had complex syntax, there was an activation with Broca's area, Brodmann's area 44, 45, and they concluded that this activation was due to an increase on the working memory. This was confirmed through electrophysiological data. When integrating syntactic information, the left posterior superior temporal gyrus became active. Grudzinski and Friederici theorized that this region was most likely used to support the integration of syntactic and lexical information between the left and right posterior superior temporal gyrus. This was supported through ERP measurements, with the discovery of a late centroparietal positivity that occurred 600 milliseconds, P600, after being presented with information. The most important thing that Grudzinski and Frida Rissi concluded was that syntax processing actually occurred within the left anterior frontal gyrus, IFG, and not Broca's area. Not only is the IFG responsible for syntax processing, but other subdivisions are involved in different stages of syntax processing. See areas in syntax processing for further information. The seat of syntax? Recent studies on aphasics have shown that while Broca's area does seem to be associated with some aspects syntax processing, not all lesions are situated within Broca's area. Dronkers et al. 1994 performed an experiment that examined morphosyntactic processing, i.e. structure of sentences, in people who had lesions and in people who did not have lesions. They found that when patients had a low score on morphosyntactic tests, they typically have lesions on the left anterior temporal lobe, Brodmann's area 22, rather than in Broca's area. Also some patients who did have damage within Broca's area had no sign of a severe syntactic deficits. It seems that Broca's aphasics are capable of understanding the syntax for certain structures until complex sentences are used that involve complicated word orders. These results suggest that while Broca's area is likely to be involved in syntax, it may only be restricted to complex sentence structures instead of various types of syntactic processing. Other studies have shown that Broca's aphasics may exhibit deficits in semantic processing as well, which is further suggestion that Broca's area may not be solely involved in syntax processing.
Different studies have utilized different neuroimaging techniques in order to compare and contrast different types of syntactic processes, such as comparing complex sentences to simple, sentences to word lists, sentences with pseudowords compared to senseless sentences, and comparing sentences that have syntax violations to ones that do not. The following sections are based on a review paper by Khan and Swahab. Complex sentences versus simple sentences When comparing sentences with complex syntax to simpler sentences, the assumption is that simpler sentences will not have as much syntactic operations as complex sentences, and thus will not activate areas within the brain as much as complex sentences do, Khan and Swahab, 2002. This assumption was tested by having subjects determine whether two sentences with different syntax had the same meaning or if they had a separate meaning. It was found that there was enhanced activity in Broca's area, more specifically with Brodmann's area 44 45 in the left hemisphere. It was occasionally found that Brodmann's area 6, 9, 21, 22, 23, 24, 30, 31, 32, 39, and 47 would activate. Complex sentences consistently activated Brodmann's area 44 and 45, but researchers were careful to ascertain that this did not mean that syntactic processing resided specifically within Broca's area. This was because while these areas did activate while analyzing sentences with complex syntax, there was another factor at play that may explain the activation of these regions. Memory load. It appears that Broca's area is activated when sentences contain ambiguous words, which supports the idea that Broca's area is necessary for processing and memory for syntax. Sentences versus word lists further evidence demonstrates the concept that Broca's area is involved in processing load by the way of contrasting sentences to word lists. After research compared complex sentences to simple sentences a problem arose. How do you tease out which activations occur specifically for syntax, since both sentences use syntax? It was assumed that if researchers contrasted a sentence to a word list, that they would be able to determine specific areas within the brain that were activated during syntax processing versus normal word activation. When comparing sentences that contained a syntactic structure to unrelated words in a list with no syntactic structure, it was found that Broca's area was not significantly activated. The sentences used were not complex which is most likely why Broca's area was not activated. Instead it was found that Brodmann's area 38 would activate bilaterally, and it has been found that this area corresponds to the region responsible for patients who had morphosyntactic problems, see Dronkers et al., 1994. This implies that Broca's area is involved in processing load rather than actual syntactic processing. These tests were not optimal for proving whether Broca's area was activated. This was because researchers were unclear that activation in Broca's area may be due to differences in semantic operations and syntactic structure between sentences and word lists, i.e. a sentence may have different semantic operations than word lists. Researchers reduced semantic processing through the use of a new test. Pseudo-word sentences versus senseless sentences. In order to reduce semantic processing, pseudo-words and senseless sentences were used. Pseudo-word sentences, also known as Jaburwiki words, are sentences that are grammatically correct, but verbs, adjectives, and nouns are replaced by pseudo-words. These pseudo-words are phonologically and orthographically correct for the language being examined, but they lack meaning. Senseless sentences consisted of using existing words in grammatically correct sentences that made no sense. The concept of using Jaburwiki sentences and senseless sentences was that they may activate regions within the brain more than a normal sentence because they lacked semantic cues. The result of the experiment showed that Brodmann's area 22, 38, 41, and 42 activated in Jaburwiki sentences. It was found that a medial area of Broca's area was activated through the use of Jaburwiki sentences compared to normal sentences, lists of pseudo-words, and lists of real words. No frontal activation was found though so it was believed that the activation seen in Frida Rissi et al. 2000 study was perhaps due to task demands and not a result of syntactic processing. Sentences with syntactic violations versus sentences without syntactic violations, the last process to determine whether or not syntactic processing was situated within Broca's area, involved studying sentences that contained syntactic violations to correct sentences, i.e. flowers can grow versus flowers can grow, or sentences that contained a different type of violation, i.e. flowers can run. It was believed that when sentences violated syntax, areas involved in syntactic processing would become activated because the normal processing operations would become disrupted. It was found that sentences with syntactic violation did not typically activate Broca's area, but instead would activate superior frontal activity.
areas that were typically involved in semantic violations, Broadman's Area 6 and 8 were activated, but it was believed this may be because syntactic violations would have a consequence for the interpretation of sentences, thus activating regions involved in semantics. This was controlled for through the use of Jaburwiki sentences in other study, and it was found that in these cases Broadman's Area 44, Right Hemisphere, and 45, Left Hemisphere, would activate. However it was found that Broadman's Area 44 would activate for conditions that involved error detection, which suggested that this region was not involved in just syntactic processing. Different syntactic processing systems when it comes to syntax, there are several different categories of syntax that have separate processing systems. These different categories associated with syntactic processing are word category information, gender information, and verb argument structure. Studies involving ERP measurements have shown that word category information processing is processed before other syntactic information like gender information. Hahn and Frieda Rissi performed an experiment that involved participants listening to sentences that may be semantically incorrect, syntactically correct, syntactically incorrect, or both. They found that when a word category violation has been made the brain processes this violation anteriorly in the left hemisphere around 150 to 200 milliseconds. However, when a gender information syntactic violation has been made, this is processed later, at 300 to 400 milliseconds, within the same region. After ERP measurements demonstrated that different aspects of syntactic processing are processed separately, High et al. attempted to localize these processing systems within the brain. Word Category Information Processing versus Gender Information Processing Heim, Optis, and Frida Rissi, 2003, performed an experiment where they used FMRI scans to show that there was a difference in syntactic processing within Broadman's Area 44. BA 44, they designed an experiment in which subjects had to perform different decision tasks, i.e. determine whether the gender of a noun was masculine or neuter. The reaction time of the decision was measured via pressing a button. Since FMRI was being used, High et al. were able to localize the different decision-making tasks to distinct areas in the brain. They discovered that word category information and gender information were processed in separate regions of BA44. High et al. also discovered that different regions of Broca's area were activated during specific syntactic tasks, such as activation in BA45 for gender information, and activation within BA47 for word category information. Both of these regions are known through various research to be involved in semantic processing. Areas involved in syntax processing areas within the brain that are involved in syntax processing. The IFG is a region of the brain which is found to be the most important aspect within a syntactic processing neural net. The IFG is responsible for parsing. It has been postulated that when it comes to syntactic knowledge, the left anterior brain appears to be involved in this type of processing. Friederici et al., 2003 proposed that when it comes to syntactic processing, there are two systems involved. An automatized initial process that is involved in the structure building process, as well as a second system that kicks in later for a controlled process of syntactic repair and reanalysis. Neuroimaging techniques have shown that Broadman's area, BA, 44, which is the IFG, is responsible for syntactic processing. Frieda Rissi, Mayer, and von Kramen, 2000, performed an experiment using event-related FMRI to study processing of single words. The purpose of using single words that varied in their syntactic and semantic status was to determine which tasks activated what areas. They discovered that syntax processing within BA44 can be broken down into other components. They found that the inferior portion of BA44 is actually responsible for processing local structure building and word category information, while the mid portion of BA44 is involved in syntactic memory. Other areas involved in syntax processing are the cingulate gyrus, the left superior frontal gyrus, the left caudate nucleus, the middle and superior temporal lobes, the anterior temporal lobe, the posterior temporal area, and the right hemisphere of the brain. White matter pathways that seem to be involved are the dorsal pathways. The arcuate fasciculus and the dorsal pathway that runs from the superior longitudinal fasciculus to the posterior temporal lobe. When it comes to human language, it seems as though the latter white matter pathway is particularly important. Models Kahn and Swahab's model of syntax processing one model proposed by Kahn and Swahab, 2002, is that different regions within the brain are linked together to form a network for syntactic processing. These regions are the middle and superior temporal lobes, which may be responsible for activating semantic, phonological, and syntactic information, as well as involved in lexical processing.
the anterior temporal lobe may be responsible for encoding information to be used at a later point or in combining the activated information from other regions within the brain. Broca's area is likely to be responsible for storing large amounts of information that is non-integrated when the sentences become more complex, a syntactic working memory. Broca's area may also activate the posterior and middle temporal areas to feed back lexical information, or may be involved in recruiting the visual working memory as a way to store information. The right hemisphere of the brain is also activated during syntactic processing in order to process tone, decipher ambiguity, syntactic violations, and discourse processing. Friedericy's model of syntax processing Friedericy in 2009 proposed a new model that involved the language areas of the brain, the superior temporal gyrus, STG, middle temporal gyrus, MTG, the IFG. Her model incorporated both gray and white matter as a way to explain language processing. Friedericy included white matter in her model because the areas between the brain need a way to communicate between one another, and white matter fiber bundles do this through connections to adjacent and distant brain regions. Friedericy believes that the arcuate fasciculus is the white matter pathway between the IFG and the STG, but research remains inconclusive. Through fMRI and other imaging studies, other white matter pathways have been identified such as a dorsal pathway that runs from BA44 via the superior longitudinal fasciculus to the posterior temporal lobe. This pathway also contains connections to BA40, the lateral middle temporal gyrus and superior temporal gyrus, as well as other ventral roots that connect to Broca's area. Two ventral pathways also exist. The extreme capsule and unisonate fasciculus which connect to the anterior superior temporal gyrus. While her model focuses on how language was processed rather than just syntax, it provides valuable information that was previously unknown. The model does mention that when children are younger, they should have problems with processing complex syntactic sentences. This is because the dorsal pathway that connects language areas is not yet fully myelinized within children. Evidence, behavioral and functional imaging, does support that the dorsal pathway for children is not fully myelinized and that this weak myelination may be responsible for deficits in syntactic processing. Chapter Summary Syntax Processing arose out of Broca and Wernicke's discoveries, which were the first stepping stones of real science that began to localize syntax within the brain. As technologies evolved and grew, the search for syntax began to as well. Herps led researchers to the conclusion that syntax was a separate feature of language processing and that it was different from semantic processing. The results of Herps led scientists to other technologies like MEG and fMRI scans to try and pinpoint where in the brain syntax processing occurred. Scientists made the surprising study that what was classically called the seat of syntax, Broca's area, was actually not involved in syntax processing but instead was used for memory load when sentences became complex. As researchers designed and created new experiments, they began to tease the different faculties of syntactic processing apart from one another and realized that syntax processing was a complicated procedure that involved many different processing systems, such as structure building, gender information, etc. All of these different processing systems localize to different regions with the brain, some of which are subdivided into further categories, i.e. the IFG, that are involved in syntax processing. I hope that after reading this chapter you now have some idea as to what syntax is, how it works, and where in the brain syntax functions. Syntax seems like a simple process, but when you delve into the nitty-gritty details about where syntax actually functions in the brain and how it communicates to other aspects of language processing, you begin to realize the huge amount of power that syntax processing harnesses.